Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Melrose School Committee. The date is Tuesday, October 12, 2021. The time is approximately 7 p.m. My name is Jen McAndrew. I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, welcome to everyone. I would just note that this meeting is being broadcast and recorded by our friends at MMTV. For purposes of taking attendance, Ms. Hogan, will you please call the roll? Mia Broder? Here. Mr. O'Connell? Here. Ms. Razi Thomas? Here. Mr. Selm? Here. Ms. Driscoll is absent. Mr. Obremski is absent. Ms. McAndrew? Here. And with five members present, we have a quorum and we are ready to proceed. Let us all please stand if we are able for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, for God, 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 indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. for all. Thank you all. Mr. O'Connell, could I ask you to grab the uh, public comment sheet, please? Yeah. Thank you. Should we leave? No, you're fine. Thank you all. Um, first up this evening, we have our school spotlight for this month. And in October, the spotlight shines on the Franklin School. Um, Superintendent, do you want to introduce this uh, topic? Sure. Um, I'm so excited to have Principal Rasso here, um, along with some of her colleagues, which I'll let her introduce. Um, we had a chance to visit the Franklin School, the Franklin School last Friday. Myself, Mayor Broder, and School Committee Chair McAndrew. I also got to go back and visit the Franklin School again today. So, um, feeling all the joy and excitement that comes with early learning, and so happy to have Principal Rasso here tonight to talk with us about the Franklin School. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Kuchenberger. Um, I brought with me one of our special education teachers, Andrea Laco, who is in a new role as a special education teacher this year. Um, she's working with uh, teachers across the district in the elementary schools to really make sure that all of the students who leave the Franklin are included the way that they were um, at the Franklin, that they are included in their elementary schools in the same way and she is a coach to those teachers who are welcoming students who may be very new um, and some of their learning styles may be very different so we're excited to have andrea here with us to share some of the excitement that we feel at the franklin about our all of our including all our students and i invited um, kim leonard is our administrator for special education at the franklin she's also works at the Roosevelt School in the TLC program. Um, she has been with me for as long as I can remember <laughs> at the Franklin, and we are excited. Her official role is the special education coordinator for the Franklin and the Roosevelt, so we're excited that they're here. Our spotlight on including all students, really the um, reason why we decided to do this tonight is we wanted to share our excitement for Andrea's position, which was part of the budget proposal from last year, was really moving forward with inclusion. Um, and taking from the Melrose Public School Mission Statement, it makes sense that we too are doing all that we can to ensure that our, all of our students reach their potential. And uh, it takes an entire community to do that. We start with not just the academics, but the social emotional learning and the foundation of the Franklin School. Our paraprofessionals are going to sing for you our theme song of the <laughs> ABCs of the ECC. Um, we use every moment that we can to make sure that the message about inclusion is shared. This was, I videotaped with their permission on my phone at our October early release day professional development.
So the ABCs of the ECC has really been the focus for the beginning part of the school year. The, we have a new mascot, thanks to the mayor and the superintendent, who encouraged me to make sure that we were aligned with the other elementary schools who also have a mascot. So we have adopted the building blocks, building blocks, Fox. <laughs> um, certainly keeping with the alliteration and had to go one step further and add some rhyme into that. Um, the kids have been loving it and the paraprofessionals were being introduced during the professional development. They were being introduced to our PBIS supports for our students, um, the positive behavior intervention supports, and what the Franklin Fox, if you look at, um, come to visit at the Franklin, you will see foxes everywhere. Um, and the kids are really excited. They, the paras were getting backpacks that day with a fox, and it was full, filled with um, little cutout letters, ABCs, that the students are, learn, are earning as we recognize them for acting responsible, being respectful, careful, and safe. And they are all over the school and very excited about it. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as part of the presentation, um, Donna had asked that I reach out to some families that I had had um, their children in my class, and so we did a little interview. You, throughout the presentation, you'll see um, three different moms discuss their time at the Franklin and beyond, and um, I feel really blessed that I work in a district that aligns personally with my goals and my, my philosophy of teaching, which is that all children, no matter what, can learn. And it's us as educators, our job to figure out how we can do that and how we can meet their needs. And um, the Franklin, I feel like, does an amazing job of not just setting up ch these children for success for school, but also for the city of Melrose. I feel like you don't build a house from the top down. You start at the foundation and wear it. And being led by Principal Rosso is a blessing. She is amazing at doing just that, and you'll you'll hear it in all their voices tonight. What does inclusion mean to me and my family? Everything. I work in a district in which some students are automatically put in a small learning group based on their diagnosis. They're never given the opportunity for inclusion. It makes me sad for these students and how much they could have gained given the opportunity. I feel fortunate to have grown up in and live in Melrose, a community that values inclusion. This education model has benefited my family tremendously, and my son has had great success at the ECC and now the Winthrop. His peers see him like we do, no different than anyone else. His teachers and classmates have been amazing and see him and love him for the person he is rather than a diagnosis. He's a kindergartner, just like they are, who might need a little extra help in some areas. Everyone gets what they need to succeed and that looks different for every child. When inclusion starts early, children learn acceptance, patience, and compassion. My son has learned so much from his teachers and peers, and most importantly, he feels loved and safe, and he knows that he can accomplish anything he puts his mind to. When inclusion is the norm for all elementary, middle, and high school, it promotes a widespread acceptance in the community. When my son applies for a job and the hiring manager has gone to a school in an inclusive environment, he's not going to think twice about giving my son the opportunity for that job. And isn't that what we all want, to feel valued and included? Thank you. So it doesn't come without a lot of effort. And I, I know the slide is small. We will make sure that we share it with you. but. Um, Kim will highlight some of the um, pieces that come together to really support the little boy that um, mom was talking about, but all of our students. So this slide is a snapshot of who our little friends are at Franklin at this point in time. Um, in our preschool, we have about 30 program students, and what that means is that there are 30 students who have been identified as needing a high level of support. Um, and their diagnoses range from autism, developmental delay, communication disabilities, and neurological disorders. Um, these children go through our program. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you speak? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, these children 
go through our program through a couple years of preschool and then oftentimes into our kindergarten setting. Uh, right now we have about eight children in kindergarten who previously were in the preschool program and received um, programming support. We have about another probably eight or nine children who will be qualifying to receive preschool programs over the next couple of months. Um, we work really closely with early intervention to receive referrals, do the evaluations, identify needs, and put intervention in place by the third birthday. Um, our kindergarten students, this is the third year, right? Third year that we've had kindergarten at Franklin, which has been really exciting. It has grown every year um, in terms of the classrooms we have, the needs of the students, and the number of children coming to us. We're, we've been really excited about that. Um, within that kindergarten, we have five students who previously were enrolled in private ABA schools and have come back to us. So we're really excited about the relationships with those families. We have 21 languages um, represented in our, in our Franklin community, and that's something I think that's grown a lot. That, that's just kindergarten, 21 different languages. Yeah, that are amazing. in our three kindergarten <laughs> classrooms. Um, and then we also provide a lot of related services. We have over 50 students who receive speech and language, 20 students who receive occupational, occupational therapy services, 10 students with physical therapy, and about 15 students with discrete trials. Um, and those numbers are growing throughout the school year. I think that's, is there anything else that we wanted to highlight? I think for the first time this year, thanks again to the budget process and some of the ESSER money, we have two academic interventionists at the Franklin. The, the microphones are partially so we can hear you, but mostly so our fans at home watching on TV can hear you. Perfect. So thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so the two academic interventionists, can you go back to that slide, Rob? Mm -hmm. Margaret, thanks. Um, so this year for the first time we have, because of the ESSER money, um, two academic interventionists who are providing support in our kindergarten classrooms. So it, you're, we're talking about tier one, tier two, and tier three supports for not just preschool, but kindergarten as well. And so the tier two supports with the academic interventionists, students will move in and out of those groups. They're not there for, for the school year, but currently based on um, the initial beginning of the year assessments with Dibbles, um, there are 10 students that are in our math groups working on the DICE approach, which all of our students are, but these are, they're getting an additional dose of that DICE approach to math. There are, a, I can't see that well, 13 <laughs> who are, are receiving um, Great Leaps support, and then there are five students participating in a kid writing group, and 20 students who are receiving, in addition to their um, tier one support from their teacher, they're receiving a tier two intervention from the academic interventionist with the lively letter. So really exciting to have that support at the Franklin. In addition to our tier three, which are the special education supports that Kim talked about and our, our general education supports. And so this is the um, general education support, really the foundation, what um, Andrea talked about. And there are three kindergarten classrooms at the Franklin right now, and all of them are designed to meet the needs of all students. Two of them specifically are into what we at, in the district consider integrated kindergarten classrooms. So there are students that are placed in that classroom with special education needs and they are peered with their um, general education peer students and the just right amount of support from the teachers and the paraprofessionals. Um, so we have a TLC model, much like what is at the um, Roosevelt, but a kindergarten model of that. Um, and then we have a program that has more of a communication need in combined with our 
um, dual language learners, and then a general education classroom as well. There are 14 preschool classrooms this year. This year, for the first time, um, based on the needs of our students and making sure contractually we're meeting all of our obligations. Our students are there five days a week um, for five hours and 15 minutes, which allows our preschool students, our preschool teachers to then have um, the afternoon to do their plan for their planning time and their lunch time. So we have nine general education classrooms and those general ed classrooms can have students with special education needs, typically those students receiving related services. And they would have one teacher and one paraprofessional for up to 18 students. And then we have five integrated classrooms and those integrated classrooms will have what what um, Kim described as program students. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education would consider that they need at least 15 hours of special education support. Most of our students are receiving about 25 hours of special education support. Um, so those would have a, one teacher and additional para supports based on the needs and they would have up to 16 students in those classrooms. I know when Jen was here, um, she said I should remind everybody as often as I can, we still have openings at the Franklin for tuition, the tuition-based program this year. We are at back to capacity, still maintaining our um, health and safety protocols, but we still do have um, openings in just about all of our, all of our preschool classrooms. So this takes a, a large team, as you can imagine, to meet the needs of all of these students. Um, and there is a list of the um, supports, not the numbers necessarily, but it includes everybody from the school nurse to our custodian, our paraprofessionals, um, and then based on the needs, our support staff, occupational therapist, speech therapist, um, physical therapist, we have a vision and mobility therapist, school psychologist, social worker, the academic interventionist, and a BCBA or board certified behavior analyst. Much like our planning that goes into who we have for specialists and who we have in the building, our curriculum also is very much focused on meeting the inclusion needs of all students. So if you look at um, the Handwriting Without Tears program actually was a program designed by an occupational therapist. So it doesn't just meet the needs of our special education students, it's really de developed specifically for that developmental need of all of our children. The same with Lively Letters. Lively Letters were, was developed by a speech pathologist and uh, the development of sound production um, is, uh, it's amazing. It, both of those programs then also carry on into um, kindergarten. The second step was designed by social workers, school psychologists. So as you look at the choices of curriculum that we have, you can understand why we are able to meet such a wide range of students. Mandy, you're going to introduce this next one. So this is another um, mom of a a girl that I had, a student I had in class for about three years, and now um, the little girl is over at the Lincoln doing a wonderful job, and um, this is her mom. I, I thought it might be helpful if you even talked about um, hiring that teacher. Jen? Developing oh. that, that program. Sure. So when we had um, this little girl at the Franklin, she was in an inclusive classroom that I was teaching, um, and so it was me and some paraprofessionals. Sorry, I need the microphone because I'm super <laughs> important. Um, it, <laughs> it was myself and some paraprofessionals, um, and the little girl was in with um, 15 other students, and when we were thinking about transitioning her to elementary school, um, 
we needed to think about what that would look like for her. And so the district, which again makes me very happy to work for this district, um, goes ahead and builds a program, literally, um, at a different elementary school and made sure that they hired someone who had the right degrees and the right background knowledge and the right belief system to make sure that this little girl and other little kids to follow would be included in every aspect of the elementary school that she's at. So she is receiving, um, academic services outside of the general education classroom and her speech and OT and PT and other things like that. But the rest of the time she is connected to a general education classroom where she is welcomed with open arms and seen as one of the children um, in the school. And it was a beautiful process to go through and, and interview and find the right match for her and watching the program develop over the last couple of years has been wonderful. Hi, my name is Carrie Robach. My daughter is Reese Robach. She's in the second grade at the Lincoln in Melrose. Reese first started at the ECC when she was three years old. She's transitioning out of early intervention and going to pre-K in an inclusive classroom. I was really nervous. I wasn't sure how any of this was going to work. Um, I was, you know, I had typical parent concerns like, is she going to make friends? Is she going to fit in? Um, but I also had the concerns of a special needs parent being how is it all going to work for her and her needs? Can they do this? Um, but Andrea and her team and the school was amazing. Um, they, Reese has gotten all the supports that she needs and then some. And when Reese started in Ms. Andrea's classroom, the kids in that classroom were incredible. Everybody was so accepting of Reese. Um, I was just blown away by how accepting the kids were. Three and four years old, and here comes Reese. She's using a walker. She is unable to talk, but she's in their classroom, and it was like they didn't notice. I mean, that's one of the things about Miss Andrews' classroom that I thought was really incredible was that the kids saw Reese as Reese. You know, yes, she has differences, but it was like they saw her as Reese first, and I thought that was really amazing. Um, one of the things that I really loved about the inclusive classroom is that Reese is being encouraged and pushed, and she wants to do the things that the other kids are doing, and that's really incredible for her. I mean, that is pushing her forward, whether it's on the playground, in the classroom, painting, dancing, um, Whatever it is that they're doing, she wants to do what the other kids are doing side by side with them. She's also learning how to build those relationships and the social, the social interactions with the other kids. And also on the flip side, those kids are learning how to interact with her. They're learning how to problem solve and they're learning how to communicate with her. And learning how to communicate with kids that may not necessarily be verbal communicators, whether it's an iPad or a different way of communicating, but these typically developing kids are finding ways to play with their peers, whether they are able to speak or not. And I thought that was amazing. Uh, those are things that they will use for the rest of their life. And that's just the way the, the real world is. It's like this little pre-K inclusive classroom is sort of a representation of how the real world is. And um, that was one of my biggest takeaways with being an inclusive classroom. Um, Reese has always been accepted and loved at the Lincoln and at the ECC. I mean, everybody from the teachers to the therapists to the staff, I mean, Reese knows everybody at those schools, and she is fully loved and supported by, by everybody, even in the community. Um, everybody has been extremely supportive. So I am so grateful to have an inclusive classroom. Um, you know, I think it benefits both Reese and typically developing kids on a, on a daily basis because it is preparing them for what the, what the real world is going to be like when they grow up to be adults. So I am so grateful for that. Thank you. Hi, my name is 
So it takes really intentional te teaching. Um, this is an example of one of our classroom teachers this week teaching, uh, last week teaching all of the students together how to play red light, green light. Um, and it's just a quick little video that captures the intentional work that doesn't just happen in the classroom, it happens all throughout the day and it includes all of our students. All right. So you can't see, but there's a student with a big sign sitting on the bench who is controlling all of those peers, whether they move <laughs> or not move. So they're turning it from go to stop over and over right. again. The, the, in order to do this, it's not, again, not just what we do on the playground or in our classrooms, but it's also the partnership with home. More and more of our students are coming with needs that require alternative communication, or AAC communication, augmentative and alternative communication. And it takes training. Our parents are not trained speech pathologists. Our teachers are not trained speech pathologists, and so our speech therapists work with us to make sure that we understand what to do and our parents understand what to do. And these are two quick little video clips of one of our speech pathologists who is teaching teaching our parents and um, our, our paraprofessionals how to use the devices that our students have. I think you can make it bigger. Margaret, that video, if you. Oh, wonderful. The aid of language stimulation with the Brown Bear, Brown Bear book. I'm going to read it and then show you how I took her. Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. And so really making sure, <laughs> making sure that we're using the same books that we use with all of our students, with our students who with the aided language devices. And the slow pace in which Michelle is showing the parents ha takes a long time. What we saw for a long time is if we were doing this at school, but the parents were not able to follow through at home, that communication device is not going to be successful or used by the child. So really making sure that we partner with our families and provide them with the supports that they need because navigating those devices and being able to find the language that they're going to need can be tricky. We don't need to see, we, we'll skip to the next one. Ms. Michelle oh. here, can we put <laughs> I'm going to talk about the hands-on learning experiences. Sure. So as you'll see in the pictures, um, everything in the classroom, we try to do as much hands-on stuff as we can. <laughs> um, and it, in doing so, we make sure that everybody is included. Um, so no matter what the science experiment or the social studies lesson, math, ELA, um, we find a way that everyone can work together and make sure that it's something that they're interacting with. So the social emotional learning pieces are really critical. And I think these are both the videos that we already saw, the, the um, ABCs of the ECC, and the other one is the um, red, red, red light, light, green light. Yeah. So some examples of our, our paraprofessionals and our teachers 
I will say for the first time this year, my grandson is with us at the Franklin. Um, and it has always, I've always been so proud of the work that we do. But for the first time seeing it through the lens of a grandparent, um, my daughter and son-in-law I know are sacrificing significantly to pay for um, the full tuition at the Franklin. And when I see Alexander come home from school and see how much he is learning and how much um, that inclus inclusion environment for him is really shaping his life. He feels he knows that the students with more significant needs are having their needs met, and therefore he also knows that his needs are going to be met, allowing all students to reach their potential. And this was um, after about one week of school, and I will say before that, this is his first school experience, he was not doing any drawing or any writing, um, and he wrote about his first experience at school and really the beginning foundation of what Dr. Adams has taught us all about kid writing and really telling their story. So he's talking about his emotions about starting school and how he felt about it. Um, but just really exciting for me to have that other lens and see what students are doing. And it is that first picture on the left. It doesn't just happen on the playground. That is in um, a therapy session, so you see two speech pathologists working with students that have aided language devices, and they're working together to help them use those devices in that, that therapy session, but then they will also then be able to bring them back into their classroom. So it is definitely a community effort that is done very intentionally by every person in the environment. And this is our last um, video for the night. And again, this is a mom of a little boy that I had in my class, and he is now at the Roosevelt School. And a blessing from COVID is that I got to have him back in my classroom last year for a K-1 split, which was wonderful. And this is just another example of how inclusion is being done well at the Franklin, and we like to see it carry through to the elementary schools and beyond. This is a family who obviously lives in Melrose. Um, the dad is a Melrose police officer. Um, the older brother is in the, um, on the football team. So this is a family that will be with us forever. And, and just knowing that they're included in part of the community has been wonderful. I have a son who's seven, um, Sean, who has Down syndrome and autism. And Andrea asked if we'd make a quick video. Um, basically, Sean has um, started his school career at the ECC, and he's always been in an integrated classroom. So he spends some time in the classroom, and then he also goes for services like PT, OT, and speech, where he's either in a smaller group or a one-to-one -one setting. Um, he's currently now at the Roosevelt in second grade, and he is still doing the same services, still an inclusive classroom, and he's doing great. Um, he's making friends every day, and um, you know, kids just want to know more about him, which is great. It's like an opportunity to be inclusive and explain how Sean is the way he is, um, which is wonderful. And um, just being in a community that has like a Vivian Goes Coffee or you know an upcoming inclusive park, that's great. You know, um, even my sixth grader, when his friends are over, and Sean gets excited and wants to hang out with them, and they all let him stay. It's just wonderful. So, Mike and I are just really grateful to be in a community um, that really does want to include everybody, and um, we just feel really lucky to have great teachers and paras and therapists to help Sean, you know, every day, just um, doing his thing. So, thank you very much, and uh, have a good day. Bye. <laughs> So a lot of exciting work at the Franklin. 
Um, and it is, it takes a village. It is not just done by one person. And it, it is exciting as part of the budget process that we advocated for um, the opportunity to have Andrea, her position is a full-time position. We took her out of her classroom and she is going into the elementary schools to coach other teachers across the district. So um, working sometimes with Sean's teachers over at the Roosevelt or Landon's teachers at the Winthrop School or Reese's teachers at the Lincoln School. She's back doing the supports and, and at Franklin we have a really large community that are all doing those same things. But as our students go off to the elementary schools, we know that those teachers may not have that same community. So um, making sure they stay connected to the Franklin and that we provide them with the supports is um, really an exciting opportunity and we're excited to have Andrea doing that work with us. Thank you, um, Ms. Serino, Ms. Leonard, Principal Rosso, thank you all so much for that in-depth presentation. Um, are there any questions or comments from the committee at this time? Um, seeing none, I'll just um, thank you all again and also mention one thing if I could, um, which I learned on our visit, but also you mentioned tonight. Um, I think it's really important to explain that um, Point that five students that were previously enrolled in private ABA schools are now returning to the district to be in kindergarten at the Franklin. So for folks who, um, you know, everyone here I think knows what that means, but um, just to put a finer point on that, that means that those districts were, those students were out of the district and they would have been out of district place for kindergarten in other districts probably. Um, and they're back in the Melrose School community in kindergarten at the Franklin. Um, what that says to me as one school committee member is two things. First of all, we're having students in their home community is so important. We heard from those parents how important that is for their students. Um, and also, it's important to note that that is fiscally responsible on the part of the district um, that we are educating those students in the district rather than paying out of school uh, private tuition. So I just want to highlight that work because I think it might seem like, oh, five students, that's not a very big deal. That is a huge deal in one school to have five students come into district in kindergarten. So thank you all very much for, for that work and for everything yeah, and that I, you I will do. say some of, some of the students that we're talking about could potentially be with us as postgraduate students, not all, um, but so that if, they, if we don't make sure that they are brought back into the community and learn how to learn in an inclusive environment that it, if we don't do it young or as young as possible, it sometimes can be much more challenging and much more difficult Difficult and unlikely that they will not only be able to learn in an inclusive environment, but then after um, post-grad live in an inclusive environment. So um, it really important word. I know we can put a financial price on it, but in terms of the well-being of not just that person, but us as a society is really critical work. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and to you. your colleagues as well. <clears throat> thank you all. Next up, we have the report of our student representatives. Our new student representatives are joining us for the first time tonight. Um, Mr. Salm, do you want to introduce them? Yes, please. Uh, with us tonight is Ruby Robichaud. Please correct me if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, and uh, Morgan Kirby. Uh, they will be with us going forward. Uh, they may not stay the entire time tonight. This is an introduction, but welcome. Thank you. Welcome <laughs> to you both. Do you want to um, just say a sentence each about, about yourselves? You don't have to, but right into the mic. Um, so I'm Morgan Kirby. Um, I'm a triplet. At, or No, I am a triplet, but I'm a senior at um, Melrose High School. And yeah, looking forward for Looking forward to a good year. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Ruby Robichaud. I'm also a senior at Melrose High School. Morgan and I have been friends since kindergarten at the Roosevelt <laughs> Elementary School. Yeah. 
Great. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for being with us. We look forward to working with you this year, and thank you. Excellent. Um, next up, we have public comment. This is the portion of our meeting where members of the public may address the committee for up to three minutes each on topics before the committee tonight. Uh, we have three people who have signed up, um, David Goodhue, Matt Hartman, and Sarah Moderano, who signed up by email. Um, David? And just a reminder, as I'll do throughout the night, to speak into the microphone. Thank you. Well, good evening to the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak before you. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, the two issues that I'd like to comment on is uh, the first one would be mandated vaccines and for the uh, employees of the school department. Um, the, there was a uh, study that just came out today. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it came out today <clears throat> from Israel. And it basically it said that people exposed to COVID-19 who have already been exposed to it prior to the having a, a vaccination have developed natural immunity and that these people should not um, take the vaccine because it, it, it can cause them to lead it can lead to stroke and paralysis. Um, and the other comment that I want to put on the table is I'd like to ask a question of each of the school committee members. What is your, uh, can you tell me if CRT, critical race theory, is being taught in the, our school system? So that's, that's, all I have to say, and I look forward to hearing to, from what the hearing from each one of you as to uh, where we stand on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodhue. Um, next up is uh, Matt Hartman. Matt, you recognized for three minutes. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all again in City Hall. Um, Thank you for tonight. I'm looking to speak about the demographic study, the population study that's on the agenda tonight. And um, I wanted to start by just mentioning a few historical facts from DESE about where Melrose has been, which isn't in the study. And importantly, you know, looking back, 2011 was the last time we had an incoming class of kindergartners less than 250. 2014 was the last time we had a class less than 300 in kindergarten. And so even with pandemic impacts over the last two years, we still haven't had a kindergarten class that's less than 300. So all the projections that we've seen over the last couple of years, including the one you're gonna talk about tonight a little bit more, um, don't see incoming classes of less than 300 anytime in the near future. All the projections agree with over 4,000 students that, as being the norm for the future of Melrose. Um, and so looking at the current projection, I think it's probably a little low and uh, I think there's a few things to look at in regards to that. One of, the, one of the key ones I noticed was the first grade is certainly undercounted for this year, what we've seen. Um, and it's important to note about the first grade because they are in the projection going through all of the years. Um, and I also think it's important to note when we're undercounting students in a projection, when we have confirmation numbers versus the overcounting, because it's a lot harder to create space for students in the future when you didn't plan for them. Um, in addition, even in the documents tonight, uh, one of the things that jumps out at me is that the, the population study used the 2019 adjusted number for the population of Melrose, which turned out to be pretty wrong. And it's a thousand more people that were counted in the census this year, as opposed to what the 2019 number was. So we don't really know, you know who those thousand people are, if, if it's you know, filled with kids or, or whatnot, but we should really take some stock into that and in thinking about the study and the numbers that we see. That, that projected city growth is a difference of 6.8% growth of Melrose in the model versus 10.5% of actual growth. So it's a, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, I also think this leads to a conclusion that we will need to open more space in the schools. Um, every study has been clear on that, that we, we're, we're looking towards a lot more students. We need the space. Um, especially in the elementary schools, 
They'll be continued to be pressed for more space in the very near future. The geography is also going to be a more challenging question as well. Outside of this body, the City Council is looking at the new ward maps around the city. And it shows um, really increasing geographic imbalances of where our population is. Um, the, the southern part of the city seems to be growing a lot faster. I think we could point to some of the areas where that's happened uh, than, than the rest of the city. The Lincoln School and the Hoover School and those adjacent neighborhoods show the most growth. But, you know, residents in those areas are already not able to gain entry in a lot of cases to those schools. So parents are going to be more and more likely to be forced into cars, crowding the streets in the morning to get their kids to other neighborhoods to go to school as we force that adjustment. Uh, I hope the current study that's in front of us tonight can be understood in the context of a growing community, that we need to finish the work of the override that we all worked on together a couple of years ago and begin using the funds that were made available by that vote to give the district the space it needs for the future. And, you know, this is a really comprehensive question of space. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're talking, we've always talked about this bubble moving through the, the elementary schools. Well, the bubble is hitting the middle schools, we all know. It's going to hit the high school. It shouldn't be looked at as a bubble anymore because it, it really isn't. Um, it is much more akin to a rising sea level that we need to have long term solutions for. And we need to start having this conversation and bring about answers. Um, you know, here at this committee and in the public, the public needs to be engaged in this because the work we've, we've all done together to move it to this point where we can, we can take advantage of these things. Um, we have the space now because of that work and now we just need to start using it and opening it. So um, hopefully that's helpful for looking at the, the study tonight and I thank you for the few minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Hartman. Uh, next up is Sarah Moderano. You're recognized for three minutes. I will be very brief and thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm actually happy to have been here and be able to uh, hear Donna and her team talk because it sort of um, is a great segue for some of the concerns that I currently have. Um, my two major concerns that I'd love to bring to the attention and hope to get some conversation going with the community um, would be first around um, the current situation at the schools for uh, the lunchtime and around the safety plan for COVID. Um, I know within your safety plan, uh, you know, we focused on hoping to try to get the kids outside as much as possible, which we have done an amazing job, uh, I believe, at all schools doing. However, uh, as a parent myself, um, that has taken a lot of um, legwork for the parents to initiate. Um, I would love to see the school committee and uh, Dr. Kuchenberger um, support us in coming up with a better plan around this. Um, myself at the school that I am at, which is the Roosevelt, um, I pretty much have put in well over an hour a day of my own time um, coordinating it and reaching out to parents and fulfilling up to six spots of parents coming a day. Um, to make sure that our students are outside uh, eating safely. Um, and this is just, you know, it's not going to be sustainable through the whole school year. So I just am, um, my biggest question, I guess, to the committee and to Dr. Kuchenberger is how are we going to manage this for the year, knowing that we have minimal staff in most of the schools to continue this, um, as well as even if we move the children inside, um, staffing is very minimal. Um, so I know that uh, Ms. Um, McAndrews had brought up that, um, you know, there was maybe a chance of talking about some sort of program that we could use with COVID funding, maybe hiring lunch aid people or having a stipend for um, the volunteers. Um, that's my first concern, um, just because I'm sort of head in it right now. My second concern goes along with that is it seems that we are really in a major um, position, poor position of paraprofessionals right now. And I know we still have a lot of those positions on our site that we're trying to find, and there is a shortage. There was just an article that came out yesterday um, from Colorado that there is a nationwide shortage of this position. Um, so 
you know, I think, I think for here in, in Melrose, you know, we're very forward thinking and progressively thinking, and I really would love to try to advocate, you know, how we can change that, um, how we can move forward and not have this continue. I think COVID has caused a major um, change in that mindset for that position. Um, I think a lot of people have realized it's a tough position and it's a position that, you know, you could go a little bit further and uh, become a teacher instead. Um, and, you know, we're gonna keep seeing a decline in people taking those positions. Um, and how can we sort of change that, which obviously is affecting our students greatly. Um, so those are just my two concerns that I wanted to bring to you guys tonight that I hope um, as a community we can continue talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of the members of the public who joined us this evening um, and who emailed us as well. Um, thank you all. And without objection, public comment is now closed. Um, next, we have the announcements of the superintendent, Superintendent Kuchenberger. Thank you so much, Chair McAndrew. Um, I have two announcements tonight. Um, the first is about the Melrose Community Book Project, and then the second will be about um, COVID testing and um, different COVID-related updates. So I would like to invite Marcera Finger up to the podium. Um, she has a brief presentation for us, and while she gets settled in, um, I'll do a little introduction. So Marcera is a junior at Melrose High School and also the founder and president of the Melrose Community Book Project which has been responsible for free reading programs for Melrose Public Schools elementary students since summer 2020. This fall, the MCBP, or the Melrose Community Book Project, will be running virtual sunshine story time and once upon a time book club programs, as well as in-person writing workshops. Um, oh my gosh, you even have stickers. This is amazing. <laughs> um, I lost track there. Um, programs as well as in-person writing workshop program at Melrose High School. And so they've, these programs have already been approved and supported by Mr. Corgan, who's one of our assistant principals at the high school, and also um, her advisor in the English department, Mrs. Lowell. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Ms. Sarah to give us a brief presentation about the Melrose Community Book Project. OK. Cool. Um, OK, I think I'm talking into the mic. Um, Hi everyone, um, as she said, my name is Marcera Finger and I'm a junior at Melrose High School and I'm here to talk to you about the Melrose Community Book Project. So what is the Melrose Community Book Project? Um, this is an organization that I started in July of 2020 and what we do is we run virtual and in-person reading programs for elementary school kids here in Melrose. Um, all of our programs are free. They're run by myself and other high school volunteers, and they're open to um, all kids in grades kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, and I'm here talking to you about it today because our fall session will be starting this weekend and next week, and I was invited to share a bit about what the MCBP does. Mm -hmm. um, just a bit of background, like kind of our mission. So the goal of the Mellers Community Book Project is to provide opportunities for elementary school kids to read, learn, and have fun. Um, as I said, I started this in July of 2020, so during the pandemic, when everyone was really stuck at home, um, libraries were closed, summer camps were canceled, pretty much everyone was isolated. So I kind of took that and tried to make it into a more positive situation and connect with some of the elementary school kids here in Melrose. Um, since July of 2020, when I started this, we have run over 126 hours of free programs for elementary school kids. Um, these have been run by 30 Melrose High School volunteers, and we've reached more than 75 kids at the elementary schools. Um, like our main reading programs that we have, we have Sunshine Storytime and Once Upon a Book Club. These are virtual programs. These are the ones I started out with um, at Winthrop Elementary School virtually the first time I ever did this, and they've, we've kept them through this whole time. Sunshine Storytime is for kids in grades K to 2, and it's just like a story time where the volunteers read a book to the kids, and then they get to participate in a group activity like acting or drawing. Um, Once Upon a Book Club is kind of what you would think of as your traditional book club where the kids read a section of a book coming in, and then they get to discuss with the volunteers what happened in the book, um, maybe do activities, games, etc. 
Um, from these kind of like two initial programs that we did, um, I was able to do a girls in STEM special event in the spring, which was kind of like taking our story time in book club and doing a STEM themed one, which I really enjoyed. And then we were also able to run a virtual story time for an elementary school in Lowell. Um, again, since these are virtual, you can more easily connect with people not in Melrose. So that was a really good experience. Um, so all of those are virtual. And then this past summer, we were able to actually run two in-person programs. Um, so at Melrose High School, we ran a writing workshop for kids in grades three to five, um, where they got to try out writing different genres of writing and share their writing with their peers. And then we had a summer homework study group for kids in grades kindergarten through fifth. And they got to come in, work on their summer homework, spend time with their peers, meet new people, et cetera. Um, these are some of some pictures. This was the first ever Sunshine Story Time, so summer of 2020. You can see they all have certificates because at the end of each of our sessions, I love to send out like a digital certificate for them to kind of commemorate um, their work. This um, was the first virtual Once Upon a Book Club, also summer um, Winthrop Kids, because that's what I started with. Um, this here is just one of the story time groups not run by me. Um, this was for Roosevelt Kids. This was fall of 2020. And then this is one of the Once Upon a Book Club groups. Um, they're all doing little foxes with their hands because the book was PAX, so it was about a fox. Um, this is from our Girls in STEM event. We were able to have panelists, um, women in STEM from Melrose, actually come and talk to the kids about their experiences and um, get to answer their questions, which was really fun. And then this was our first ever in-person program writing workshop. You can see we gave them all booklets at the beginning that they got to decorate, and then they got to write their, like everything in there and then take it home at the end. On the left is our poetry from writing workshop. Um, the idea was from um, Sabrina, our vice president. So shout out to her. She kind of made the whole tree. But the kids got to write their poem onto a leaf and then kind of put it on to display all of their poetry. And then on the right is summer homework study group. Um, we, and we went outside on a stretch break. Since our classroom was <laughs> right near the Mars mural, we figured might as well take a picture there. <laughs> And then last, my last picture is of the volunteers. These were the people who volunteered in the spring. I don't have a more updated photo than that. Um, but these are all high schoolers who spent every Friday afternoon virtually talking with me, preparing for their book clubs and their story times, and then actually ran them. Um, special shout out to Ms. Lowell. She's our club advisor. Um, she's a ninth grade English teacher, and she helped me um, at the end of freshman year when I had this idea all the way until now. Um, I'm a junior, and she's still kind of guiding us through it. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's my presentation. Thank you all for your time. Um, if you happen to know anyone with elementary school kids who you think would be interested in signing up, all of our information about the fall session is on our website and our Instagram and was, I believe, emailed out to families. Um, yeah, our registration closes Friday the 15th. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you, Mercera, and all of the volunteers. That's awesome. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mayor Broder. Bravo. I mean, this is really good stuff. It's really amazing that uh, this stuff I couldn't do as a 55-year-old, well, 57 <laughs> and you're doing it like in real time with your peers. It's amazing. Is it open to um, Melrose kids who might not be in the Melrose public schools, say St. Mary's kid or a homeschooled kid or maybe a charter school kid? Um, that's a good question. I haven't been able to like reach any kids who aren't in Melrose um, just because like I email the principals of the Melrose public schools. So whoever gets it kind of that's who it ends up being open to. But. Awesome. No, it's terrific stuff. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Razzi Thomas, please. I th just want to say, uh, Sarah, amazing that you're able to figure out how to do this during a pandemic. 
There's so many good things that have happened during this time that we don't pay enough attention to. It's, it, it's also been a time of struggle, but thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Mercera? Seeing none, thank you so much. And thank you to Mercera's mom for being here too. <laughs> thank you, uh, Superintendent, more announcements? Thanks. Sure, um, up next, I, I just wanted to share a little bit of data regarding what our weekly pooled testing is looking like. Our consent continues to grow each week. Um, we are updating our dashboard daily with positive cases if and when they occur. And then we are also updating the consent tab weekly. So um, that was just refreshed today. We are in some schools well over 80% participation in our routine testing programs. Um, and then of course we also have the test and stay and the symptomatic testing. So far to date, we are averaging, when we first started, we were doing about 200 pools a week um, across all eight schools. Uh, this past week, we were well over 250 pools, so that just gives you a sense of how it's growing. And remember, each pool has anywhere from three to 10 samples and individual samples in there. So we're collecting on average at this point, well over 2,000, we have well over 2,000 individuals participating across all eight schools. Um, each week in just the pooled testing alone. Um, we have seen more positive cases than we would like. It very much follows uh, the trend of the unvaccinated. So it's exciting to hear news reports about the possibility of younger students having access to vaccines soon. Um, we know that it's much needed and will really help keep kids in school. Particularly um, at the middle school, we've seen a, uh, the highest number of cases. And that really has to do with the simple fact that we have six elementary schools where elementary age students who aren't eligible for the vaccine are spread throughout, but there's only one place to go to middle school in Melrose. Um, and so that's where we're seeing the concentration, concentration of cases. And it is specifically um, trending to those who are unvaccinated. This past week, we had our first um, quarantine at the middle school where we did have to quarantine several students who were close contacts. And that was really due to the fact that we had five unvaccinated students um, in one day test positive through the test and stay program. And that was on the first day of their participation in the testing program. So the pool testing is great when folks are participating. It helps us do that surveillance testing that is so necessary. It allows us to do those routine wellness checks. Um, we have been able to identify positive individuals through the pool testing program, which allows us to isolate that individual right away. And then we start contact tracing. Um, and if, they, if a student or an individual is determined to be a close contact and they've consented, they then can participate in the test and stay program. But as we all know, the, the best risk mitigator still remains the vaccine. Um, so I looked at our, our citywide data from last Thursday, and it hasn't really changed much since the previous week. We have high vaccination rates with our students who are eligible, um, but with our middle school age group, which is the 12 to 15, there was no change in the number, the percentage of fully vaccinated individuals and just a 1% change um, for those who've had their first dose. Sim the data looks similar for the older age um, group. There was no change in the fully vaccinated data, I believe, and like a 1% change in those who are getting their initial vaccine. So that tells us that some folks are still um, deciding to get vaccinated, which is great. We would like to see those numbers rise um, because it's proven it bears out in our data that when students and, and adults are vaccinated in schools, we aren't seeing as many COVID cases. So that's a general summary. I won't read through all the different um, aspects of the dashboard to you, but I do encourage folks to take the time to filter through and like look at your child's grade level and filter out some of the other grade levels. Right now, the high school, school data kind of skews the district data because there's so many individuals who are vaccinated at the high school level and they're not necessarily consenting or completing that that aspen paperwork if you haven't done that yet though whether you want to participate or not you still need to go in and do that because there's some policies that you have to acknowledge and you also need to update your emergency contact information so that concludes my report for tonight
Thank you. Um, any questions or comments for the superintendent? Mayor Broder. A couple of both, or maybe one of, one of each. Um, in terms of participation in uh, the various testing programs that are offered, um, if someone is confused or struggling for whatever reason, um, I want to make sure you can, you can get into that program at any time, correct? Yes. And if you are trying to figure it out, what, what is the place to call or email or ask if you're not sure how to navigate you know, the electronics or the forms or whatever the case may be? I would get in touch with your building principal. Um, I know that several of the principals have even set, on, set up one-on-one -on -one sessions to walk families through. I've done the same over the phone, so they can also reach out to me. Um, we've also done like a myriad of reminders and we keep getting like a, a little bit more personal with each one. We've done some general, then we did direct emails to folks. Um, our next step is to say, do folks need paper versions of that? And uh, folks should know that we are adding resources. You know, we, are, we are adding a couple bodies. Folks should understand that the, what we're talking about, what was just mentioned in paraprofessional world is yep. true in um, nursing and um, even the folks that do our testing at Cataldo or assist with that are having a hard time growing the workforce fast enough to, to meet the demand. And we certainly see it in other districts that um, haven't gotten their testing up and running, mm -hmm. most typically because of a problem at the state as opposed to in the district. Um, but we are, um, seeking to add a, a per diem nurse to help really to help with the volume and to help with um, any any kind of personnel disruptions or, or whatever the case may be because folks are working very 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 hard we're also if we haven't done it already are adding a an additional contact tracer that is going to be dedicated to uh, the school community and making that work you know, as, as efficiently as possible, and certainly if we see opportunities and need to, in, to increase that, um, we are prepared to do that, assuming we can actually find qualified personnel to, to take on that role. Yeah, um, thank you for, for that, Mayor. I just met this afternoon before school committee with our health director, Anthony, and the nurses, and we were talking about some of the challenges. It really is a lot to navigate all three testing, types of testing. Cataldo does come in and help with the pooled testing, but to your point, the, the staff that we receive is not consistent, so a lot of the, that responsibility is falling on principals and nurses to make sure that that happens as efficiently as possible, because obviously we want students to get back to teaching and learning as quickly as we can. So Anthony did confirm that there will be a school-specific contact tracer who's been working through training. Um, that will be a huge relief. Um, because every time there's a positive case, there are three to four contacts per close contacts per class. And so at the middle school level, that adds up really quickly. Um, the, those cases that I was speaking about last week ended up with 42 close contacts. So that's a lot of kids, individuals then, if consented, participating in the test and stay, which then requires data entry after the testing is done. So it's, it's a lot. Um, it looks really different um, to be a school nurse right now and to be a principal right now, but I can't say enough about how hard everyone's working to make it the best possible situation. Thank you. Mr. Razzi Thomas. Just um, thank you, Mayor, for giving us your side of the things. I just, I really want to encourage um, our new public health director to step into this as much as he can, getting the lay of the land and supporting the superintendent and the principals to to allow them to focus on teaching and learning. So the more we can work together to all work on that would be fantastic. And uh, I think that the level of work for the principals and the nurses is extraordinary as well as for you, Dr. Kuckelberger. So we're here to support you and we're here to try to inform the community about what they can do to support you and the principals because we want the best possible education to be delivered to our students during the tail end, what we hope to be the tail end of this pandemic. Mm. So please let us know what we can do for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too am heartened to hear uh, what the mayor had to say about uh, more, bringing more resources to bear in this regard, much appreciated, obviously. Um, 
you know, I think there's a growing concern uh, that we've all had for a while that, you know, we're, we're become very much involved in, in the public health business. Um, and the concern being that, you know, that's happening to the detriment of our core mission as, as an educational uh, institution. Um, and, you know, we're hearing uh, about the stresses on the school nurses and the principals, we're, we're seeing it. Um, and all of us uh, are seeing those emails that go out uh, every day, um, sometimes two and three uh, a day about new cases. Um, and when I see those, you know, I'm concerned about the district as a whole, I know we all are, but I'm concerned about those principals uh, who are sending those emails and having to deal with that. Um, and, you know, I, and, and I think back, as we all do, to two or three years ago uh, when those principals were focused on education and, and, and the kids um, and, and the core mission of the schools, and now they have this whole other job. Uh, and you too, Superintendent. Uh, Ms. Rassie Thomas just, just spoke to this. And we all know it. And it's, I, I guess, you know, the, again, once again, as I always do, I'm stating the obvious. I mean, I, I'm growing more and more concerned about how sustainable this is uh, as a practical matter and, and as a personal matter for the people involved. Uh, I felt like last year everybody was called upon to step up in a big way and did. Uh, you know, did their job and then some, and, and now that it, we're doing it again, um, you know, I, I know I and others are growing more and more concerned about how much time we're spending on this stuff as a school district as opposed to what we're doing uh, with regard to academics. And, you know, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Superintendent, I, you, you don't need to comment on this. If you have any thoughts generally, We'd be happy to hear them. Uh, I know it's a big topic and a big question, um, and I'm not telling you anything. Mm -hmm. I know this is a worry for you as well. Uh, let, let me ask an easy question, and you, you can expound if you want. Beyond what the mayor has uh, put forward, which is hugely important, um, are you lacking in any other regard for resources? Uh, we're hearing that our need for additional personnel is, is being met and about to be met, and there's a plan in place for that. Is there anything else financially, anything else? Is it just the bodies we need at this point? Is there anything we can do to take some of this burden off of the principles? Yeah, so the, the, there's been a lot of folks in the community who've reached out and asked just that question, even folks who've gone far as developing ideas and plans in a really thoughtful way, and that's we are so appreciative of that. Um, to, to your point about this being added to the plate um, and possibly detracting from the mission, it's true, it is a whole new realm of responsibility, but at the end of the day, if kids aren't in school, it doesn't matter how great our educational programming is, so it's essential. This is what it means to be a superintendent or a principal in the middle of a pandemic, right? We have to take care of health and safety first, always, um, and so, we do that work while also keeping um, our eyes focused on the educational programming. I would argue that um, we've enhanced educational programming this year in a lot of ways, in some of the ways that you heard Principal Rasso talking about, but in the way that um, Dr. Adams is recruiting supports for our, our expanded, we've doubled the size of our interventionists, um, and we're making good on that investment by making sure that those folks have the professional development and support they need. Um, it does, put, principals are pulled in a lot of different directions, but they're still focused on making sure that all of our students are growing and learning and thriving. And um, through our equity walks that we've been doing and our data work, we're really actually honing in on, you know, how do we make sure that we're accelerating learning for all students and addressing that unfinished learning. So um, it's not this or that, we're doing both. You know, how sustainable is it? I don't know. <laughs> um, but when I hear that vaccines might be available for our youngest students before Thanksgiving, that makes me feel like, okay, you can do anything for two more months, <laughs> three more months. Um, and we will be talking about 
some creative ways that we plan to use our existing resources in order to provide some additional supports in the buildings in the coming weeks. So that's all part of our data analysis and problem solving. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. I, I appreciate you speaking about it. Uh, we didn't talk about this in advance. I'm yeah. sorry. No, it's okay. on. <laughs> it's one of those things that, you know, like mm -hmm. all of us, it's been weighing on me. And uh, so thank you very much for addressing it. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Mr. Selm, and then back to my runner. Mr. Selm, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through the chair to the superintendent, uh, can you confirm, uh, as of now, we have no cases of in-school spread? In school. Um, I would say the last case, the last cluster of cases, and I know cluster is a technical medical term, so I probably shouldn't be using that, but the last related group of cases that we had at the middle school, um, it's, it, 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 there had to have been some in-school spread. And yeah. that, would, I would say, is the first since way back in the fall of 2020 that we've had concrete evidence of that. Um, so and that's that, the first case in a year plus? Yes, yeah. And we've tracked down the roots of that. And may, uh, what corrective me uh, measures have we taken? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's tricky to tell which way it came in, but it was um, several students who were connected at multiple times throughout the day. So, but it's hard to say, like, what was the root cause? We have not been able to make that determination. But what we did do, um, which is the, the second time that we did this this year, was those students that were close contacts to this group of folks are quarantining. Um, so unless they're fully vaccinated, um, the recommendation is for them to quarantine. Did the uh, having groups of kids, cohorts of kids go through same classes throughout in blocks, mm -hmm. did that help limit the spread? In this situation, it's really about their educational programming. We, have no, we aren't clustering kids at the middle school this year like we did last year where they, the kids literally stayed in the classroom and the teachers moved. They have more flexibility in their schedules. Um, this is really more about the educational programming of this unique group of students that caused that to happen. Uh, so uh, I, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Mr. O'Connell, for asking the question I was thinking. Uh, what more can we do as a body to uh, help uh, uh, you and your administrative team focus on education uh, over, <laughs> over health care? which is really what we've been growing into over the last, well, even before COVID, social emotional learning was a huge part of that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so while this has been a continuation, uh, this is not, I can't imagine this is what you went to school thinking you were going to manage. Well, so There, there uh, was that time when I was um, just becoming a new principal when we were talking a lot about H1N1 and mm. trying to imagine what it would be like to be in the midst of a pandemic. Um, Here it is. But I certainly, I remember being, you know, at the time, obviously young and thinking like, could that really happen? <laughs> and so then here we are. Um, I think I would want to meet with the leadership team and really think hard about what would be our ask, if any, um, beyond what the resources that we currently have. Um, but I do say that we feel well positioned at, at this time with the support of the mayor and the health department. Um, really, it's we need to release some of the pressure on the nurses and the principals with the contact tracing. Agreed. Thank you very much. Yep. Mayor Broder, did you have something else? Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um, a, the, the, the city and the school, which is somewhat of a, I think we all know is an artificial distinction, but we meet regularly to see what we can do and, and how we can do it. Uh, to give a little context to kind of the state of play across Massachusetts in terms of COVID testing and protocols, um, late today, um, the Globe reported that Governor Baker has announced he's mobilizing the National Guard <laughs> to assist in testing uh, because the number of schools, both public and private, that are testing has gone from something like roughly 1,300 to 2,200, and the, the types of testing have, have also grown. So this is a problem uh, 
a lot of folks are grappling with. You know, it's a fairly, uh, we've seen the National Guard and, and thank God they're out there and we're grateful to have them across. Say we start in skilled nursing facilities early on. Um, but it is, it is somewhat regrettably an all hands on deck situation. You know, we'll continue to, to look for, for opportunities locally, but we'll also keep looking you know, across the state and um, talking to our friends in state government about how to make this better as well. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Dr. Guggenberger. Um, I'll just make two final points if I could. Um, the first is just an acknowledgement of the tremendous amount of work that everyone is doing. All of my colleagues spoke to that. Um, but just to put in context, I think it's important, Melrose Public Schools are doing a tremendous amount of testing compared to most other districts like us. And you can look on the state data, which is released once a week about cases in districts and testing and see that that, that is true. So we are catching a lot of cases, not all of them, through the routine testing um, and then from those cases also implementing the test and state program um, with the required quarantining outside of school for those students, which is a really important thing that we need parents and the community to um, cooperate with us on. Um, but we are doing a tremendous amount of testing and I wanna acknowledge you and your team and all of the school nurses, our health director, uh, the mayor and his team is tremendous, which leads me to my second point, which is I think what we're hearing tonight from the committee is that we feel that we have resources available. We know we do. We have more personnel and, and postings. I believe in addition to what was mentioned, there's a high school nurse opening posted as well, um, in addition to the per diem person and the um, contact tracer. Um, we need people to fill those spots, of course, as we do with paraprofessionals hall monitors at the high school, um, building subs, daily student supports, et cetera. Um, but you know, I think what you're hearing is that there's a will on the committee to do more um, if, we're, if it's needed um, based on your and I would say the health director's recommendations to us. Um, and also I would just continue to encourage us as I know we are to think creatively it may not be our first choice to deploy volunteers. It may not be our first choice to sign volunteers up for stipended positions. I know that. I understand all the risks and associated um, challenges around that. But if we're talking about getting through a six week, three, two month, whatever period till we can get our children down to age five vaccinated, I think we should sort of really continue that all hands on deck approach. So. Thank you for what you're doing and for what you all will continue to do. Um, any final comments on this topic? Seeing none, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Next up is our consent agenda, which this evening includes the following. The school committee regular meeting minutes from September 14th, 2021. The school committee special meeting minutes from September 25th, 2021. Policy BEC for final vote, executive session. The personnel report, the monthly budget summary, the cafeteria report, and the warrants as follows. Fiscal year 22 warrant 13 in the amount of $491,487.38. Fiscal 22 September debit card 14 in the amount of $488. Fiscal 22 school to warrant 15 in the amount of $5,837. And fiscal 22 September high school wire in the amount of $8,607.59. Are there any agenda items that any member of the committee wants to remove from the consent agenda this evening? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Made by Mayor Broder, seconded by Ms. DeSelm. All in favor? And that motion carries with five in favor and two absent. Thank you all very much. Next up is the work of our subcommittees and up first is Educational programs and personnel with Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm just going to leave this. <laughs> Can I leave this here? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Even Sue. Good evening, folks. Welcome to Educational Programs and Personnel. Uh, we have one item on our agenda. It is the final program review for our visual and performing arts department. 
Superintendent, do you want to introduce this? Please. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, tonight, uh, we're excited to share with you the work of the Visual and Performing Arts Department as they present their final program review. Um, as you know, this year through the FY22 budget cycle, we were able to advocate for a part-time .6 Visual Performing Arts Director. That's Mr. Stephen Black, who's been with us since mid-July. Um, definitely been so critical to have this position in place, particularly where we've had some turnover in this department, and he has been working around the clock to make sure that none of our programs miss a beat, um, that students still have access to all of the things that they love and the competitions that they have come to be accustomed to participating in. And as you know, we have an exciting list of shows coming up as well. Um, and Mr. Black is accompanied by Dr. Adams, who will take it away from here. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams, for your leadership and work on this review. Um, thank you. We are proud tonight to present the work of the Visual and Performing Arts Program Review. Um, first, we'd like to thank all of the teachers um, this year who, um, and who participated in the last two years and given feedback in meeting um, to look at the curriculum, to look at instruction, to help us collect data and information. So we first want to extend our gratitude um, to all of the teachers. Just to um, just share a little bit about our process. We started um, two years ago in 19, would be 1920, um, 1920 in the fall of 19, um, with uh, a group of teachers, we would meet monthly where teachers would share curriculum, um, their instruction, their assessment, the very teacher-led process. We also surveyed the community, surveyed um, staff, um, surveyed students, got feedback from them. We did some focus groups as well with students. Um, the only thing that we were not able to do, we, we completed this program review mostly during the pandemic. The only thing that we were not able to do was our site visit. Um, past program reviews, we had groups of colleagues come and see teaching and learning and give us feedback, talk to teachers and students. We had it planned. We were going to do it in March of last year, um, but given different program changes, we just felt that we just couldn't do it. And, and staff um, said, yeah, we, we really appreciate not doing it. It was just too much. Um, and so we would like to do it at a different point, but um, just felt um, we did want to move forward because we had completed a lot of work and not hold off moving forward, just waiting for that particular piece. The program review also starts with some essential questions. These are generated by the teachers. What do they hope to find out about um, their program? Um, those visual and performing arts um, are very important to students' social emotional learning needs and the um, teachers wanted to learn how the program is impacting um, students' SEL needs. How is the program visually, um, the visual and performing arts horizontally and vertically aligned? What are the best instructional practices and assessment practices that teachers are using? The visual and performing arts really focus on the creation process, performances, how are students responding to the arts, and how, how does arts connect each other? How does it connect us across communities um, and connect with each other? and what are the resources that the program has and what's also needed. So I'll share with you briefly um, the summary, uh, a summary of our findings. Um, some of the strengths, um, often students and families would mention particular teachers and how those particular teachers would share their love of the discipline um, with their students, um, with their children. There are strong community support in Melrose for the arts. Um, as exhibited by many programs that are offered in the community as well as the strong parent groups um, that support visual and performing arts. The visual and performing arts have been working already, teachers um, doing their own professional development and as a group thinking about how they can embed and support the social emotional learning goals of the district. 
We have outlines of curriculum that help support um, alignment K through 12. And teachers are using, um, there's very specific examples that exist at each grade span of personalized learning, goal setting, digital portfolios that we can build upon and strengthen for the future. Um, opportunities for growth. We have a new arts curriculum framework that presents an opportunity for us to align um, new curriculum. The department's been working on the inclusion of diverse voices, but really it, there's an opportunity to continue and expand that work and deepen that work about inclusion of diverse vo voices and amplification of the voices of uh, marginalized groups. Um, the general music program has been mostly focused on a singing tradition. Um, and they really wanted to, the teachers want to really help broaden that and think about how they add more physical components, um, dance, um, other musical instruments that really expand um, the, their own repertoire. Um, and they're excited to start and begin that work. Um, continue to support vertical and horizontal alignment. There exists some, but it needs to be more clearly articulated. Um, and seek out new opportunities for arts programming. We have um, some very, we have some arts programming that's existed for a long time, and we see opportunities for different types of courses um, that could be developed in the future in conjunction with the teachers and also student input. We'd like to, there's a lot of social emotional learning practices going on in the department and outlining and documenting that will help sustain those over um, the long term. With the addition of theater arts in the middle school um, this year, we see an opportunity to really strengthen the theater arts curriculum and make a pathway for grades six through 12 um, and really look to collaborate with out of school um, um, organizations and other organizations to develop a real pathway for the theater arts um, and potentially in the long term think about an elementary um, component that's more clearly articulated. Hello, good evening everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the action plan which you will see um, is outlining the opportunities for growth that Dr. Adams just spoke about. Uh, so there are four goals that we're looking at as a part of our action plan. The first being to align uh, the music curriculum in K-12, to both vertically and horizontally. So we have some ideas about how we're going to align those. Revise the curriculum to provide more opportunities. And those opportunities are including more diverse voices and diverse contexts that represent not only the students in Melrose, but larger global contexts as well. Aligning the curriculum units for K through 12 in uh, theater and visual arts, uh, as Dr. Adams said, we now have that position at the middle school, so we're looking at documenting that curriculum and looking at how that transitions up through the high school level. And then looking at the social emotional learning practices that occur naturally within the arts and documenting those as part of their SEL practices. For aligning the music curriculum K to 12, for this first goal, we're looking at what the music teachers have been using most commonly at the elementary level, um, such things as conversational solfege and hand symbols uh, that it have existed in that curriculum and looking at how we can then both horizontally and vertically align them so as students grow up through the program, they're speaking this common musical language together. We're looking to foster more collaboration with community groups. Uh, we're highlighting um, some materials and determining their efficacy and we're going to look at the general music and the chorus and instrumental programs, as I said, to look at how we are going to align them so that they're having students and faculty speaking that same common musical language, uh, looking at the curricular resources we use to promote diversity and inclusion as well. You have to talk about the ukuleles. Is that coming? It's coming. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to revise the curriculum to provide more opportunities to include the diverse artists and musicians to really look at the repertoire that's being used and make sure it represents a larger global context. Um, so we're looking at what those um, materials are that we use right now in that curriculum and making sure that we integrate the social justice standards in as a part of those as well. Uh, we're going to collect and curate um, a, a variety of resources and check to see what we're using to make sure that it is all inclusive and that it's not biased. For aligning the curriculum for units for visual arts and theater arts, um, the theater arts curriculum 
Uh, now at the middle school is new, and we were making sure that we align that with a curriculum framework. And for that, we are making sure that all students right now in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are receiving the same theater arts curriculum because they haven't had it yet before. So we're gonna continue working on that as students grow through that program as seventh graders and then eighth graders to make sure that they have next steps in their progression of that curriculum. We're looking at uh, the visual arts uh, curriculum as well and making sure that we're looking at cross-curricular uh, connections as well as technology. And we're developing um, the unit, one unit per discipline at each grade span to take an in-depth look at that um, and making sure that we're aligning with those new curriculum frameworks. Uh, for social emotional learning practices, um, we are looking at um, how arts specific SEL practices are sort of happening naturally throughout the curriculum and making sure that we document those uh, in a way that they align with our district SEL efforts. Um, we're looking at um, book studies and case studies that have been done integrating SEL and the arts together uh, across the country in a variety of places. Um, and we're going to be working with Jess Patty over the course of the ne next few months, having her into department meetings and really taking a deep dive into those practices. Um, some of the other things as part of the music program too that I want to make sure that we uh, discuss is that we've highlighted certain instruments and programs and we want to thank the MEF grant for allowing us to have ukuleles at the elementary level. So we piloted that at one school and we're looking to continue that work um, with both ukuleles and ORF instruments, um, purchasing those to at the other uh, schools as well to broaden that curriculum and align horizontally that program as well. So those are the four key components of our action plan, um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have of us. Very good, thank you both. And Mr. Black, is this your first appearance with us? Um, I, I think it's the second. I, second? I came well, yeah, welcome to talk back. about the shows, thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Black. <laughs> thank you both, uh, well done. Any comments or questions from the committee? Ms. Razzi Thomas, please. Thank you, um, really interesting, um, thorough, review and um, I really, you know, it, it makes a great, it, it, I'm very, very excited about all that we're already offering and what, what this review can bring to us in terms of what we can hopefully begin to offer even more, um, more in the future. So it looks like that what I saw as a theme is you need more space in certain elementary schools, that you need more instruments, um, that you needed more cohesion and consistency between instructors and consistent funding. Um, I was curious when, you, when I was looking at the enrollment stuff, the, the into chorus, for example, like um, that there's some decrease because of the pandemic and then will it come back and all that. So I think there's a lot to like follow up on in like six months or something, maybe at the end of this year to just hear how it's going and um, that we have to keep working to make sure we have light, line items in the budget for the things that you really need to grow, keep growing all the programming. The one thing I'd also love for you to report on in the future is, are we um, serving some students but not others? So I was really curious about the enrollment, <coughs> like in the uh, visual arts in particular in the high school, because a lot of those are electives. And you know, so who are we serving, who are we not serving? In terms of students and interest and how can we continue to grow that too. My daughter's in sixth grade, she loves her theater class. So that's really exciting that that's like an automatic, everyone has to get some of that elective going throughout their whole middle school career. And uh, I'm just thrilled that we're doing all this and I hope we can continue to, to provide the funding and the support that you may need to grow the um, programs even further. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salm, please. Welcome again. Thank you. Um, so I was curious, uh, what community groups are you looking to collaborate with and what might that look like? So the, the first one that comes to mind is the Melrose Symphony. Um, I know that there's been some work done there in the past, but I would like to um, you know, strengthen that connection and look at what we can do um, more formally with that. Um, 
in the past with other communities that I've worked with, I've worked with local community um, theater groups and organizations um, to tie, put together sort of a, a performance that ties in a common theme. So I, you know, I would be willing to go out into the community and also solicit interest from various arts groups in the community that might want to participate in a joint effort of that kind. Um, so we can sort of, you know, showcase all arts in, in a, um, a holistic way in one type of event. Um, and I know that the school does a, a really good job of that district-wide in their um, arts night that they have every year. Um, but I would love to explore more ways to get into the community with various groups such as the symphony to put together some kind of, um, you know, combined performance exhibition type sort of work. I think we also thought of ways to display work mm -hmm. in more places. We had done that couple of years ago um, and have gone away, gotten away from it. And so I think that's one area where it's an easy thing to do is in, but has wonderful impact on the community by showcasing the work of the students as well as, the, as schools and the teachers. Um, I think Follow Your Arts too is a, is a great organization that's new um, that we should foster um, a connection with and see how we can collaborate and support each other's work. I, am. I think there are also local artists that we should be tapping and using more in our, in our schools as resources, um, to, as resources for individual students who want to pursue the arts in a deeper way, as well as a, as a collective as well. I think there's lots of opportunities that we just need to foster and document and really nurture, um, and we, we've lost some of that in the last couple of years. One of the wants that came up also was to strengthen sort of the technical aspects of the theater productions. And so we're reaching out to um, area industry professionals to come in and provide workshops with students and, and help train them in those areas as well. I am always heartened and uh, enthusiastically supportive of trying to showcase student work in whatever form that may be. So. Uh, this, this warms my heart, uh, as well as uh, I know it helps fulfill our vision of a graduate. Um, I, I, I note that, and, and full disclosure, I had to look up what an ORF instrument was. Um, <laughs> it had those, to be explained to me several times. <laughs> those playing at home, it's largely percussion, but not solely. Right. Um, uh, with the push to uh, or switch to ukulele and orf instruments, does that mean that the recorder is going away? I wouldn't say that the recorder is going away because it fills a need that, you know, those instruments don't in, in a certain way, um, particularly um, with the orf instruments being primarily percussion and many of them also being pitched instruments with a specific sure. pitch tied to them. Um, the ability to foster and breath support and, you know, and being able to play a note through to a specific value, those sorts of things aren't necessarily available on those types of instruments. So the recorder will still play its role uh, in that way. Um, you know, certainly those types of instruments, the ORF and, and percussion related and ukulele are much more friendly during our time right now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're certainly not ignoring the recorder, but we're, we want to make sure that, you know, students when playing together are doing so in a way that's safe and healthy. So I'm thinking about, I bring those up specifically because I'm thinking about our, uh, our, our uh, push for inclusivity and, and uh, recognizing that we're attempting to meet students where they are, learners where they are, right? Um, and these, each of these three types of instruments generally provide a different experience for the instrumentalist mm -hmm. um, in a way that is meaningful and recognizes that uh, not all interact with the world the same way, right? And so, um, you know, a, a wind instrument versus a string instrument versus a percussion, those are very different. They're all complementary, uh, but they each provide uh, a different sensation to the user as well as those that are experiencing the sound. So um, I really applaud this work. Um, I could go on on other topics, but I know my colleagues also want to talk. So <laughs> thank you so very much for your work. We, I, I look forward to the next time you come before us. Thank you. Mayor Broder and then Ms. McAndrew.
Uh, real quick, and you talk about trying to connect with, with community organizations. Um, you might have said this, my apologies if I missed it. Uh, we have some arts umbrella groups uh, in addition to the, um, the visual performing arts entities that can probably be a big help. There's a lot of enthusiasm for connecting with those folks being helpful in connecting with organizations both within the community and outside our, our four walls. And I know that um, looking at this, looking at visual and performing arts through uh, a DEI or an equity lens probably means we're going to have to look for some, some ideas from outside the city in order to, to have that fuller experience. Ms. McAndrew, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for being here and, and to all of your colleagues who contributed to this uh, departmental review. I always find these to be incredibly helpful um, and I'm appreciative of your hard work. Just a few very quick things. Um, I just want to echo the comments that Ms. Razi Thomas made about sustaining these investments over time. And to me, when I, when I see Mr. Black with us tonight, when I hear about some of these changes, the theater, teacher at the middle school, other investments that we've made, it just drives home that transformation requires resources. I mean, all the will and all the hard work and all the time and energy of Dr. Adams or the superintendent in the world, uh, we still need to make these investments in people and materials and supplies, so I hope we continue to sustain that. Um, and just three quick things I wanted to mention. You mentioned the Mowers Education Foundation and piloting that program. I would also, um, in addition to that great work, encourage you to work with um, PTOs, as I know you may be doing, just to, to loop them in on this work. I know these are curricular activities and not extracurricular, or, uh, but maybe some of the work enrichment work that they do can supplement some of your goals around this, particularly about bringing in more diversity in music and the arts. Um, so I would encourage you to get, especially at the elementary level, the PTOs involved, um, if you're not already. You mentioned displaying student work. I think we're in a room that could use some sprucing. <laughs> um, so if there's uh, any uh, interest in that, I know I don't, uh, we don't here control you, what happens you. in the chamber, but maybe the mayor can follow up on that. And I finally just want to say, I hope we see the ukuleles in one of the school spotlights sometime soon. So mm, thank that's you. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Christ they Kristen Foot has in play maybe. Kristen Foote has already requested some student art for the City Hall. So. Right. Oh gosh. <laughs> Mr. Rassi Thomas. I'm sorry to to, to have to speak again because I know it, this is a, a very ambitious agenda, but I'll be brief. In my day job I'm a clinical social worker, a school adjustment counselor, and I just think that you know, we talk about social and emotional learning and all that stuff, but what I look at is every adolescent and, and young person has risk factors and they have protective factors. And the more we offer them different ways of expression, whether it's, you know, actually through talking or song or performing theater arts or playing a musical instrument or doing art, you know, more like visual art, I think the more protective factors we offer to all students and you know and it's another way to build community so I'm just really pleased with the work that you're doing and proud of it and I want to thank you to keep keep going through this strange time that we're in because this is how we're going to get through it is to have many 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 means of expression so thank you any further final comments from the committee superintendent are you content well, then, thank you both, Dr. Adams, Mr. Black. Much appreciated. Well done. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you both. And that concludes educational programs and personnel for the evening. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. O'Connell. Um, next up is finance and facilities with Ms. Razi Thomas. Ms. Razi Thomas, I will operate some of the technology here to bring Mr. McKibben. Thank you. Think because that would be tragic if I tried. So, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> you'd have to end the meeting early. <laughs> okay. Jeez, give me a love note. Okay. Um, good evening and welcome to Finance and Facilities. Um, tonight we have a few 
presentations that the superintendent is going to offer to us. And the first is the McGibbon demographic report update. Based on our enrollment and the evaluation that we had already. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Kuchenberger. Thank you, Ms. Razzie Thomas. Um, Yes, tonight we have joining us virtually Dr. McKibben, who is the author of this demographic study. In your packet, you see the slides that he will talk through tonight, but then you also see the work of Brittany Ferguson, who is our staff and student support person in my office. Um, she and I have been thinking about different ways to provide you know, just-in-time enrollment data for folks in the community. So in that document, you see that there's a couple of tabs. It's actually a, a spreadsheet. One, we're going to capture the first of the month enrollment data all year long. And then on the second tab, we've given some um, end of year enrollment data. So that's the yellow and orange document. When you go to the next tab of that, um, which I think will just look like another page in your packet, you'll see that we've added not only um, McKibben's data in terms of multi-year projections, but we also put the Collins report and the NASDAQ report um, that's a few years older in there. So we have those three as comparisons. But with that, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. McKibben to give us an update. Okay, um, so Dr. McKibben, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, yes. Okay, and we can hear you in the room. Just so you know, I'll have to um, sort of cue you and, and feed the, the committee's questions, but we can hear you fine. And Dr. Okay. Kuchberger has her slides up, so maybe if you can okay. you talk through and just say next slide and she'll advance them for you. Okay? So All right. Ahead. And I'll, I'll try to keep this short given the lateness of the hour, so. Um, so will they, will they be able to see your, your screen? Uh, no, they can see your slide. We can see your slides, though. So you can just okay. go through um, the next slide. All right. Um, I, I can't see it, so I'm kind of going, I'm going to be turning on my computer then and, and looking at the same time. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to do a report on the evaluation of the 2021 series one forecast calculated last May for the Melrose Public School District. Um, the district has sent me this year's uh, fall ADM numbers. We, we've done a comparison by grade to evaluate what, what's happened, where the error is at, what's caused it uh, along those lines. Um, Needless to say, these are extraordinary times in forecasting, like everything else, with uh, with COVID, um, and a lot of the factors causing enrollment change is what we refer to as non-demographic. Um, for example, last year you did not have 276 students leave the district; they are still in their homes, most likely, just using other educational options. Um, we doing projects in about 23 states right now, including four in New England. So we've had a lot of data coming in and we're, we're tracking um, what has happened. The, the general algorithm we used last spring was if a district is um, in full in-person instruction by the fall, they should have about 80% of their students they lost have, would have come back, okay? Uh, most districts had heavy losses in pre-K through grade four. Um, on the ones that have come back so far, we've seen everything from 98% return rate to 50%. Uh, depends on the state, local policies, your neighbor's policies, uh, your housing market, your economy. There is a, a slew of factors in there that's affected um, <clears throat> the return rate. Um, if you're looking at the first slide, which is the forecast for last year, we had uh, forecasted that you would have 221 students return this year, um, uh, up to 80% of your preschoolers and, and most of your, your elementaries. Um, the district's enrollment, given the housing market, if it continues to have home sales, which is the backbone of your housing market, not new home construction, but existing home sales, would, would rise to about 4,100 in, in 2030. <clears throat> the next slide shows the evaluation of that. This is by grade. And of course, the first time that jumps out at you real quick is, is the preschool. 
uh, 61 fewer than we forecasted. Um, this is this is not a unique circumstance. Most school districts that had preschool um, did not get back anywhere near 80 percent of them. Um, it's voluntary. A lot of parental options in there. A lot of parents don't feel comfortable sending um, four-year-olds to a uh, public place, being around other children. So we did not see um, a large number of, of preschoolers come back. Um, it wasn't quite as bad with the rest of the grades. And at the bottom, you have broken down by, by K-5, uh, 20 below forecast. Middle school was four below, and, and high school 17 below. So the total of 102 looks looks a little daunting at 2.7%, at but 60% of that year with the preschool. So um, you're probably going to get additional students coming back as you go through the year as we get uh, past the, the Delta variant. Uh, we have vaccines available for, for the under-16 population. Um, the economy hopefully starts improving a little bit on the jobs front. So you'll probably see a slight uptick as you go through the year, and you'll probably pull more in line with the forecast. Um, your, your experience, compared to the ones we've looked at in most states, is not uncommon. It's not worse. It's not better. It's just it's just what we're seeing all over the place. Um, of concern is a little bit is um, the, uh, the fifth grade not coming back. One thing we've noticed from um, uh, COVID is in school, private school, and charter school rates all went up all across the country, and they're going to come back now um, as we return to normal. However, those rates will probably not return to pre-COVID levels, particularly homeschooling. Um, there's, there's been a, a seismic change in, in both attitude and resources developing towards homeschooling. Didn't work for a lot of people, but a lot of people also sat there and said, this isn't that bad. So you'll probably see all of those rates go back down close to pre-COVID levels, uh, with the exception of homeschooling not quite as low. Um, the last slide, and this is interesting. We, we've got partial results already from the 2020 census, which we didn't have available uh, last spring. Uh, in August, the we call it the redistricting file, PL 94171, the, um, the file that's used for political redistricting, congressional seats, um, House, Senate, and state level, school board members in some states, uh, town council seats, whatever it is. That's the numbers you use. Uh, it's the first glimpse of the results. Problem is it only has five variables in it. Total population, over a voting age population, under voting age population, race and ethnicity, and households. But it does give us a total population number, which is our first glimpse. We won't get the real in-depth data. Um, households, housing structures, things like that. Probably until January is when we'll start rolling out on a state-by-state -state basis. <clears throat> and the thing that jumped out is the census count for 2020 was almost exactly a thousand people higher than we had forecast, which I found disturbing because if the enrollment forecasts are pretty much on, even with COVID, and the population number is high, what that means is the household size is probably smaller than we estimated, and the proportion of households with kids is probably smaller than we estimated. So again, we can look at that and get the 2020 census results, but those are two very, very key variables um, that, that neither one bodes well for future school enrollment. We may have to revisit this and perhaps um, uh, reevaluate the results given the fact that there is going to be a substantial difference in um, uh, persons per household and households with under 18 population. And that's very key for railroads because like most suburban school districts in, in Massachusetts and around the country, you don't have enough births to maintain your enrollment. Um, to keep your, your current enrollment just steady, you need about 330 births per, per year. And you're not. You've been, been dropping steadily for the last 10 years. And you know, sidebar, new data coming out in 2020, uh, death or birth last year in the country just rolled off the table, went down almost 
have a fixated on COVID, the increase of death, the birth dropped as well. Um, in fact, we now have three New England states with more deaths than births. Hasn't gotten to Massachusetts yet, but um, new uh, fertility rates have, have traditionally been much, much lower than the rest of the country. So again, we're going to keep an uh, eye on the future. And I did that in 10 minutes. <laughs> questions? Oh, does anyone have any questions? Or comments? Or concerns? I couldn't explain it that clearly. Thank you. Um, I have one thing that I think you already talked about, but I'm having difficulty understanding everything that you're saying. So I just wanted to check that we, in public comment, we heard from um, someone who said that there are a thousand more people counted in the census in 2021 than there were in 2019, and that's a 10.5% growth. And that's not really, it doesn't necessarily show up in your numbers. And we also have a longstanding tradition in Melrose of many families having three children instead of two. So based on our past experiences with other projections, they've always been under. What it looks like to me so far is your numbers are very, very accurate, but we're worried about the growth. I'm worried about the growth over time that is mysteriously unaccounted for in other studies. So, Mr. McKibben, I don't know if you could hear that. Um, but well, I can't hear anything. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay. So let me just repeat that. I think uh, Ms. Razi Thomas is asking about that discrepancy in the census estimate before the census, the, the 28 and change number you were using, and the actual census number, the 29,817. And she's, yes. I think she's interested in you saying a little bit more about what that could mean. I know you mentioned that you'd want to see the age breakdown to know where that population was added. Uh, but I think she's wondering if it's a possibility that it could mean that we're undercounting the school population if, for example, people are having bigger families or um, more younger people <coughs> moving to Melrose. We had a lot of, you know, some, not a lot, some housing stock added that, that if, are we, is there a possibility that we're undercounting our school age population because of that kind of change? Did I characterize that? Thank you very much, Chair McAndrew. No, it, if it's on camera here, it's more likely going to be in the 20s and 30s is where it's going to be. You also have to remember that, that during the census, um, uh, on census day, most colleges and universities were shut down. Okay? So the kids went home. In fact, if you if you go talk to the people in, in you know, Amherst is a great example, yeah, they counted the kids that were supposed to be on the dorms, but the off-campus kids, they 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 lost those out. So they went home, and a lot of those were counted at their parents' house. So that's that's one of the factors here is, is you had all these college students home with their parents on Census Day. Where were you living on Census Day? Well, living at my parents' house, so they were in their parents' form too. And given the high proportion of your graduates that go on post-secondary education, you probably had more 18 to 24 year olds living in, in Melrose on census day than you probably have had in the last 50 years, you know. So that's one factor. Um, two, you know, there, I don't know how I can delicately put this, towns whose median home price starting out in this right now is, is, is as of this morning, $900,000 don't have big families. There's a great rule in demography. You can have money, you can have kids, but you can't have both, you know. Um, you're also in an area with extraordinarily high female labor participation and education level. And as both of those go up, household size goes down. So I'm, I'm thinking the discrepancy here is probably 20s and 30s, you know, um, and not a whole lot of kids. Um, it, would, it would have to be, I don't know, a, 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 you know, first off, you don't come out of college and start your home or your family in an $800,000 house. You start with an apartment and you move out to the suburbs. So a lot of it's continued upon 
you know, the migration flow of, of young households moving into empty nesters. And that's a point of concern because you've been averaging about 500 existing home sales per year up until this year. This year you're going to average about 350, and that's, that's a very disturbing trend. We're assuming that's going to turn back around next year and get some more supply on the market. And you can talk to any of your local real estate agents, and they'll tell you the supply of homes in the market, not only in, in Melrose, but all over, the, all over uh, New England, is at an all-time record low. So that's, that's a bigger thing. I would, you know, the census is if, if there's a thousand more people, they're not under the age of 18. I can guarantee you that. Have to see. Thank you for that. Okay, Mayor Broder, so you have a question. question. Uh, you're going to have to do it. Is that right? Yeah, or you can yeah, so the, 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 in terms of a, like a, an anomaly in census reporting because of, um, I guess called sec, uh, uh, college student location on census day. Is that what we were talking about? Because I mean, I just think of my, both when I was in college way back in the day and with my own son who was out at UMass, we reported him as living here. And I would expect that that is kind of what everyone does. Or that that's the ordinary course. And I hope I wasn't breaking the law, Lord knows, by, by filling the form out that way. But <laughs> I wouldn't expect that to be, as a layperson, I wouldn't expect that to be create a big delta in the in the population. So I think the mayor is asking for a clarification on how college students are counted in the census normally. Well, this is an issue in, in, in all New England towns that, that do their own census. Um, in New England towns, they, they tend to count the college students at their home address where their parents are at, where they're registered to vote, things like that. In the decennial census, you're counted where you're going to school, not where you're from. Um, traditionally, and this goes back over the last four or five censuses, the biggest overcount in the decennial census has always been college students because this, the universities and colleges count them where they're going to school on census day. Parents who are back home, the census form going and writing all these big tuition check. Kid lives here, you know. So um, that's why when you look at and this, this year has been the exception over previous censuses. Uh, the decennial census tends to be less than what the town census is, is because the town will count college students as back in their parents' address, whereas the census tries to assign them back to where they're going to school at. And uh, that, that, that's been around for 60 years now. Thank you. Any other, any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. McKibben. We really appreciate this update. Very My pleasure. Nice and all the great information. It's very helpful. Um, thank you for sticking with us in this weird technological hybrid model of our meeting, too. We appreciate it. Not a problem. Well, if it's any consolation, my, my next Zoom meeting got pushed back also, and fortunately they're in the central time zone, so i got to move on to that one. So um, not near as interesting as in Mississippi. So, all right. Uh, if any other questions do come up, Julie, don't, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Definitely. Thank you. We will do that. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we're going to go to summer financial update. Um, and that the superintendent will report out to us on. I'm actually going to invite Leah Secor oh. Di Lorenzo, our Director of Finance and Administrative Affairs, to come to the podium to introduce this item. Thank you for being here so late. Oh, no problem. Good evening. This summer we ran five programs throughout the district. This was a little different than we saw last summer. Um, so we did some new exciting summer projects. Um, as you can see from the bottom up from the memo that I wrote, the Summer Learning Academies. This is a grant, the grant funded program for K through 12. This was an accelerated learning for, at the Lincoln School and the high school this year. And the MECO grant hosted a summer accelerated program for grades six through eight at the middle school. 
We ran a credit recovery program at the high school over the summer for grades nine through 12 for at-risk students. We ran the extended school year as we did last year. That was um, designed to help our special education students, preschool through post-grad. And we were able to run our Alpha Best program again this year, um, unlike we have last year. It was designed for K through five, district-wide, held at the Roosevelt School. And this was being funded by parents and they were looking for um, balancing their work schedules as well as helping their children um, have a great summer for six weeks. And it generated $6,516 for the district alongside everything else. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, I have a quick one. I'm just wondering if, if the budget is what you say, for instance, the summer learning academy, the budget was 76,644 and then the expenses were 56,900. Mm -hmm. Did we make profit? Like was that $20,000 in profit? Or? So we don't, th that was funded by the summer, um, the summer learning grant as well as us or two. And those are just to get us running the program. It's not to make profit. So that um, extra or money that we did not spend will hold over till next summer. So we'll have those funds available to, to run them again. And the ESSER grants go for two years too, right? Two or three years. ESSER so. two does go for um, the next two years as well as ESSER three goes till September of 2024. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, that will conclude finances and facilities for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rousey Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Secor, for being with us. Um, next up is policy and planning with Mr. Selm. <laughs> and musical chairs continues. Thank you and welcome to policy and planning this evening. Tonight on the agenda is one item, policy J, B, D, gender identity support. This is uh, the first time it's coming before us for a vote. Um, so for purposes of discussion, I would entertain a motion at this time. Motion made by Ms. McAndrew, second by uh, Mayor Broder. Discussion. Ms. J Razzie Thomas, please. I just have a really um, one word I need to change in the policy. I wasn't able to do that ahead of the meeting, and I'm sorry, but I'm just going to change the word non-conforming, or I propose to change the word from non-conforming to non-binary, which is a much more current use word in the vernacular around your gender identity. And that would be throughout clarification. That would be yes. throughout the document. I think it's just in one place, but. Nope. There's paragraph three, you see it. Correct. And paragraph two. So twice. So I will X that out and edit that, but I still think we can vote on it as long as people are comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Miss um, McAndrew, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes, and this than... comes before us for a final vote again, right? With the Correct. change. Yep. Correct. Correct. It will go on the consent agenda the next time, I believe. Correct. So. Any further comment or discussion? Thank you, Ms. Razzie Thomas, for that. Uh, seeing no further comment or discussion, all in favor? Motion passes uh, with two abstention or two absences. Thank you. This concludes policy and planning. Thank you, Ms. DeSelm. Um, next up, we have announcements of the chair, and tonight we have a few items. First up is the committee's goals for this school year. Um, by way of reminder to the community, uh, the school committee met in one of our um, retreat sessions on Saturday, September 25th, and part of what we did at that uh, special meeting was uh, develop some goals um, 
in line with the school district's um, strategy overview and goals for the year. Um, those are in the packet uh, for review along with some action steps. Um, and they cover the topics of um, equitable recovery from the pandemic. That's goal number one. Goal number two is around um, communication with parents and the community. Goal number three is around long-term financial planning for the district, um, including a cr critical infrastructure plan for the school specifically. Goal four is around uh, community engagement process for a review and updating of the school district's mission and vision statements. Um, we, these are on for a vote tonight. What is the will of the committee around the school committee's goals? I would make a motion to approve. Mr. Second. O'Connell made a motion to approve the school committee's goals and action steps for the year, seconded by Ms. DeSalm. Are there any comments, questions, changes? Ms. Rossi Thomas and then Ms. DeSalm. Um, so I think that we're going to be doing some work on engaging with the community around the BB school and what it may become and all of that, but it's not specifically outlined in here. It's more generally in here, and I just want to check with the chair on how you want to make sure we're telling the community about that. Like, th I would assume it goes under the goal three, but do we want to add an extra bullet specifically on that? Um, great, yes. Yeah. So I, my response would be yes, that's where I definitely see um, the BB school. I also see updates um, and investments in Melrose High School there under that discussion. Not necessarily all everything to happen this year, but for the discussions around those investments in our facilities to happen. So um, certainly happy to um, add a reference there to the BB school and Melrose High School specifically, if you think that would be um, helpful, but it definitely is, I think, how we're all thinking about um, our critical infrastructure um, investment and addressing the, the space needs of the district. I think it might be good just to say examples of this will be this, you know, because I think yep. we just don't want people to think that we're forgetting about it during a global pandemic right. or that we're hiding anything, you know. Excellent. I will add that language, uh, Ms. Hogan, and get that to you. And, and if it's okay with Mr. O'Connell, the motion will reflect addition of the language for examples around the BB school and Melrose High School. Mr. Sum? Uh, I wanted to take a moment and just say thank you for both writing this up and leading the conversation. It was uh, the most refreshing retreat uh, I think we have had as a body in the time that I've been serving. Thank you for that and thank you for everyone for so enthusiastically participating with the giant papers on the wall. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, any other comments or questions? Seeing none, is there a motion to include with the addition uh, from Ms. Razzi Thomas? I mean, there is a motion. Seconded already. Um, <laughs> all in favor. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> and that motion carries with five in favor and two absent. Thank you all. Next up, we have the superintendent's goals um, for this academic year, which are also in the packet. Um, as always, the superintendent is ambitious in all areas, <laughs> including in her goals. Uh, Superintendent Kuchenberger, do you want to overview this for us? Sure. So um, what I have for you tonight is just an overview of my goals and some of the indicators that I have aligned them to based on the feedback that you all gave me during the last evaluation cycle. Um, these goals really support and connect directly to the strategy overview and also to the goals of the school committee while also making sure that um, I'm doing my job to lead the district as we continue a forward motion. So the first goal is, um, as you know, as superintendent, I write two district improvement goals, one student learning goal and one professional practice goal each year. So I continue to have equity and in, in inclusion at the forefront in my first goal, and this is specifically thinking about how we continue to build the internal capacity of all members of the district leadership team, and specifically really looking at um, examining our pedagogy, policy structures, and systems um, in order to 
make sure that we are making data-driven decisions. So one of the things that we plan to do this year toward that end is really look at the systems and structures around our hiring practices and we'll participate. Um, I've identified a team of teachers and leaders to participate in the DESE Cohort 3 Teacher Diversification Professional Learning Community. Um, and we start meeting next month. So I'll be able to outline more specific action steps as we begin that work. But here's just the general overview. Um, and then you see the two indicators that are connected directly to that. The second district improvement goal is all about developing an equitable pandemic recovery. So we are completing three equity walks per building. We've already started um, and been to many of the elementary schools. We come together as a subgroup of the leadership team. Um, we set goals with the principal before we head out into classrooms, and then we provide feedback to teachers around some of the work that we're seeing, um, specifically looking through a cultural, um, a cultural proficiency lens um, and thinking about you know, those two questions, who are we serving well and who could we be serving better is what this goal is all about and making sure that when we identify those students who we could be serving better, that we're utilizing our multi-tiered support system to implement those timely um, supports and then collecting data on those interventions. I also meet with the principals regularly, so this will become one of the data points in those monthly conversations, which leads to my third professional practice goal. Um, we put a lot of time and energy into the evaluation process, and it's important that as superintendent, I'm giving our principals timely um, written and verbal feedback. And so um, as I'm meeting with the principals, we're really looking closely at the, the mass um, the DESE school visit framework, and I'm using that to be much more planful in those monthly meetings. So setting a clear goal before the visit, being focused during the visit, and then having consistent follow-up after the visit. Um, the first two tend to be easier to implement. It's then making time to circle back and have that follow-up communication. Um, and we started, our first month was really all about goal setting. Um, and so then my job has been to give principals written feedback on the goals that they're developing um, so that we can achieve those other two goals, district improvement goals I mentioned earlier. And then lastly, um, we continue, this goal is about social emotional learning and support. So con continuing to build a district wide commitment to developing social emotional competi competencies in all students. And this will be measured by student and staff feedback along with other data sources. We've um, implemented some self-assessment tools. And I imagine this goal, once we get that initial data in hand, will become more refined over time. Right now, it's quite general in the way that I have it written here. Um, but this will be absolutely critical as I come back to you with the response to your question earlier of what else does the leadership team need in order to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. Um, and also will be um, a big part of our budget in FY23. So those are generally the goals, um, and as I mentioned, I will be adding more specific key actions and benchmarks as we go. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, for purposes of discussion, is there a motion to approve the superintendent's goals? Made by Mr. O'Connell, seconded by Ms. Razzi Thomas, thank you. Are there any questions for the superintendent on her goals? Just a quick comment. Mr. Um, O'Connell. Thank you for tying into the strategy overview, clearly. Um, and our goals as a committee, but importantly, uh, and you and I have discussed this, uh, creating them in a way that's responsive to our evaluation. Um, you know, we have a history here, quite, quite frankly, of doing our evaluations and then kind of walking away from them. Uh, we do it as an exercise. We have a great discussion about it. Um, and then that goes away and we go on to goal setting. Um, and I'm heartened to see your goals being responsive. Again, not just connected to the strategy overview, not just connected to our goals, but really responsive to our evaluation. So thank you for that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the superintendent's goals? Seeing none, all in favor? And that motion carries with five in favor and two absent. Thank you very much. Um, finally, on our regular meeting agenda tonight, outreach reports. Are there any outreach reports? 
Seeing none, I do have one. I just wanted to mention that this um, past few weeks were, was the final um, visit in the accreditation process for the high school from NIASC, um, and uh, that involved um, a meeting with representatives of the school committee, and I just wanted to thank Ms. DeSalm and Ms. Driscoll, um, who's not here with us tonight, but for joining me in that um, evaluation with the NIASC team. Um, thank you for, for that time. Um, and also to Mr. Corrigan, especially, who led the NIASC process at the high school and on the entire team that um, participated in that. I know a lot of educators, students, um, and administrators were involved in that um, very long-term accreditation at this point, which started in 2019 and was paused for an entire year during the pandemic. So. Um, Thank you for that. Um, and unless there is further business before the committee in regular session, um, we do have need for an executive session this evening for the following reasons. Approval of the executive session minutes of September 14th, 2021. Secondly, to dis discuss strategy with respect to negotiating a side letter of agreement with the Melrose Education Association Unidae teachers regarding the addition of the CREW program at the high school for the 21-22 school year as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the school committee. And thirdly, to dis discuss strategy with respect to negotiating a side letter of agreement with the Melrose Education Association units A, B, and C regarding the vaccination and testing requirements for the 21-22 school year as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the school committee. We will not be returning to public session this evening. With that, is there a motion to adjourn to executive session made by Mr. Selm, seconded by Mayor Broder? Ms. Hogan, will you please call the roll? Mayor Broder? Yes. Mr. O'Connell? Yes. Mr. Rosie Thomas? Yes. Mr. Selm? Yes. Ms. Driscoll is absent. Mr. Obremski is absent. Ms. McAndrew. Yes, and that carries with five in favor. We are adjourned to executive session. Thank you all. Thank you to our friends at MMTV. Good night.